Hello, my name is Jessica Reed, and I am a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey Earthquake Science Center in Menlo Park, California. Today I'm pleased to be talking with you about some major tsunamis that occurred in Indonesia, including some events that changed the field of tsunami research. This map of the world shows major recorded tsunami events that caused high loss of life. Yellow dots and triangles represent events that caused the deaths of between 100 and 1,000 people, and red dots represent the most tragic events that caused over 1,000 deaths. Many of the most devastating tsunami events, as you can see, occur around active subduction zones. The shapes indicate cause of tsunami, so circles indicate an earthquake-triggered tsunami, triangles are volcanoes, and question marks are unknown or other sources. Today I'm going to focus on five tsunami events in chronological order. 1992 by the Flores Sea, then 1994 south of Java, 2006 also south of Java, 2010 Mentawai Islands, and the 2018 Anak Krakatoa eruption, which is the only tsunami we'll talk about that was generated by volcanic activity. On December 12, 1992, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake occurred in the Flores Sea, Indonesia. It produced a tsunami that reached the, reached the shore in five minutes. The tsunami on Flores flooded inland as much as 300 meters with average run-up heights of two to six meters. Landslides and ground cracks were reported at several locations on the island. The earthquake caused at least 1,000 deaths and the tsunami that followed caused at least 1,000 more, particularly concentrated in Maumere and on Babi Island. The tsunami left more than 500 people seriously injured and 90,000 homeless. Damage exceeded 100 million US dollars. And on Flores, most of the buildings were damaged or destroyed, and in Maumere, 90% of the buildings were damaged or destroyed. These orange bars that you're seeing on the map represent run-up observations collected from eyewitnesses and post-tsunami surveys. These show how high the water was observed to reach. Many times post-tsunami surveys rely on marks left by the water on houses and trees. Tide gauge records are not as abundant as these observations. But the bonus of tide gauges is that they can also accurately record time and variation in water height instead of just a max height. This image on the bottom left shows a tide gauge record in Palopo of the event compared to five different models of the event conducted by various teams. The observed wave distribution of this tsunami was confusing to researchers for a while, but it was eventually explained by a model describing two general zones of slip, as you see in the lower left figure. However, the largest run-up values in Waibalan of 11 meters and Rian Kroko of 26 meters weren't well matched by these models until a research team Yi and others published a paper in 1993 that incorporated landslide activity into a model based on landslides that were known to have occurred in Rian Kroko and Waibalan. This model was reasonably consistent with observed run-ups and convinced people that landslides played a considerable role in the amplification of local wave run-up. Although this tsunami event was listed as earthquake triggered, and that hasn't changed, the landslide component generated high tsunami run-ups in focused areas near the landsliding. High and unexpected run-up could cause an extreme damage and loss of life in more heavily populated areas. One developing area of tsunami hazard assessment is actually the monitoring of submarine slope stability offshore of sensitive areas, like areas with high populations or nuclear power plants. The map above, however, shows run-up values collected from post-tsunami survey and eyewitness accounts. 
an epicenter of the earthquake is given, but here I'll overlay the rupture area to give an idea of these relationships. This is lined up with the figure below, which shows observed run-up as black lines compared to different modeled run-ups. As you can see, before ye and others, which is not pictured, these extremely high run-ups in Rian Croco and Waibalan uh, are not even comparable to the models shown. The year 1992 was an important one in tsunami research. This was due to two tsunamis and the cases that scientists conducted afterwards to better understand them. First, in Nicaragua, a tsunami earthquake was captured by a modern broadband network for the first time. Three months later, the earthquake and tsunami in Flores took place. Both events were subjected immediately to a post-tsunami survey, which recorded important information, including run-up observation, damage level assessment, inundation estimations, everything from casualties, injuries, witness interviews, deposition and erosion observations, timing estimations, and any other clues that the event left behind. These data have been used in many studies since 1992 and have fueled the generation of many models and a general better understanding of what to expect in future earthquake and tsunami events. It's not only important that these surveys took place, it's also important that information can be broadly shared to governments, research teams, and the wider community. And because this information is only really available and accurate immediately after the event, it's important that a post-tsunami field survey gets it right the first time by recording information that can be integrated into future research projects. This requires a common set of definitions for starters and also a general quality standard. 1992 is when the first post-tsunami field surveys began to be widely standardized, and it was only six years later, in 1998, the official post-tsunami field guide was published by UNESCO and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. And then, again in 2014, a second edition was published with updates. This is a map as of 2014 of all the tsunamis after which a standardized post-tsunami survey was conducted. Often, these locations received several of these international team surveys. As you can see, all of the tsunamis that I'll be talking about today, except for the 2018 tsunami, are listed on this map. And that's just because this was published before 2018. But the Anak Krakatawa event did receive an international post-tsunami survey. These survey handbooks should be flexible to meet the demands of any particular situation, but they also have to allow for reliable tsunami databases to build and cohere. On June 2nd, 1994, just two years later, a shallow thrust faulting near the Sunda Trench caused a magnitude 7.8 earthquake, about 200 kilometers off the coast of Java. About 30 minutes later, a series of three tsunami waves of varying heights were observed. There were at least 250 fatalities, 27 missing, and 423 injured. More than 1,500 houses were destroyed, and damages amounted to about 2.2 million US dollars. Run-ups from these waves were often measured from marks left by the water on houses. You can see this in the image to the lower left. The earthquake had a low frequency shallow energy, indicating a slow rupture. These earthquakes are often less easily felt but are efficient tsunami generators. The tsunami was larger than expected from the amount of ground shaking, which exposes the need for more kinds of tsunami forecasting. Here you can see a beach eroded by the tsunami waves. The photo is a little bit blurry, but I think it's important to remind ourselves of the scale of these events. In this survey after the tsunami, it was observed that different building materials were observed to behave differently. This upper right-hand photo shows platforms that once supported straw buildings. As you can see, they were completely swept away. 
The lower left shoto shows that brick buildings, especially unreinforced brick, were still severely damaged. Building location is also a vital factor. Concentrations of buildings around rivers and beaches were much more vulnerable to the tsunami destruction. It's because tsunamis can inundate, inundate great distances along rivers. In this case, the tsunami inundated along the river about one kilometer. Interestingly, corals and trees have been observed to lessen the tsunami impact to structures directly behind them. In this case, palm trees helped to lessen the destruction, but were mostly uprooted in the process. On July 17, 2006, a shallow megathrust slip, also about 200 kilometers from the coast of Java, caused a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. Also like the tsunami of 1994, minimal ground shaking gave little warning to inhabitants. At least 700 people were killed, nearly 500 injured, and 58 went missing from the earthquake and tsunami. Wave heights ranged from four to 11 meters with the maximum run up of 20 meters. As with the 1994 earthquake and tsunami, the Extensive tsunami damage and little shaking was ascribed to a tsunami earthquake. When a tsunami is co-seismic, meaning the tsunami is generated directly by the earthquake motion, a fairly shallow earthquake with a large moment magnitude, typically greater than eight, has to occur for a destructive tsunami to take place. Tsunami earthquakes, however, often have a magnitude only greater than seven and the tsunami generated is surprisingly destructive. Sometimes these earthquakes are amplified additionally by submarine landsliding. Buildings were destroyed within 150 meters to as much as 500 meters from the coast in some places. This is a damaged building near Pongandaram. The roof tiles are disturbed up to a certain height you see on this building, which can be interpreted as the height of the water. The lower left figure from Moria et al. shows the coastline extent of the tsunami. You can see the two parallel black lines. This is a 250 kilometer stretch of tsunami damage along the coastline. The upper right figure and uh, lower right hand figure as well show run-up observations taken into account for various studies. The colors correspond to certain studies. You can see a very high run-up of over 20 meters was recorded in Nusa Kambangan, primarily by Levine and Fritz in 2007. It illustrates the need for extensive surveying because a lot of these previous studies didn't take into account the higher run-up in this area. On October 25th, 2010, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake caused a tsunami. This was another tsunami earthquake, which caused primarily destruction to the Mantawe Islands. You can see that the run-up observations on the right are concentrated on the island, but there are almost no observations on the coastline. It seems that the Mantawe Islands absorbed the impact of the tsunami, saving much of the coastline from destruction. There is a recording from the Padang type gauge, which you can see as the small turquoise line, but this is measured at only 33 centimeters. This is DART station number 56001, which I believe is the left-hand yellow triangle here. It's run by Australia. The figure on the bottom shows a recording from this DART station of the tsunami wave on October 25th, 2010. And it's the black line is the observation, whereas the red line is NOAA's most model, primary most model for the event. This is another NOAA model showing the maximum wave amplitude. This tsunami is one of the more recent major tsunamis. It occurred in 2010 and was well documented by seismic stations, tsunometers, and tide gauges across the Indian Ocean. 
For this reason, it is an event common, commonly used for models like the one in front of you and is an important data point for the study of earthquake tsunamis and actually tsunami earthquakes. On December 22nd, 2018, Anak Krakatoa erupted and partially collapsed, causing a catastrophic tsunami that affected the surrounding coastlines. The tsunami had widely ranging run-ups. In Rakata Island, very close to the volcano, there was a run-up of 85 meters in one point, while on the other side of the island, it was only 10 meters. Inundation was also widely variable. This event caused 437 deaths, more than 14,000 injured, more than 33,000 displaced, and about 3,000 buildings were destroyed. Anak Krakatoa had already been identified as dangerous in recent times, given its location and the steepness of its slopes. The western flank of the cone was in particular considered to be the weakest side and most likely to fail. Anak Krakatoa additionally had been active earlier in 2018 since June. Before the 2018 event, on August 26, 1883, Krakatoa erupted, causing a tsunami that killed 36,000 people. The volcano island was mostly destroyed by this event, as shown by the dotted area in the map cartoon. But it quickly built up again, rising above sea level in 1929 and continuing to grow about 300 meters taller in just 90 years, which averaged out is about 3.3 meters taller every year. This slide is from an interesting study by Williams and others in 2018. These are satellite images of Anak Krakatoa that we were fortunate enough to capture. A satellite actually managed to capture the image of Anak Krakatoa on the day it erupted. These images show on the top left, November 19th, before the eruption and flank collapse. And then top right, the day of the flank collapse. And you can see on the Western side, a chunk has been taken out of the volcano and that is uh, assumed to be the flank collapse. Then the bottom left, already Anak Krakatoa is beginning to rebuild itself. And finally on February 2nd, a full ring has been achieved. And the colors just indicate the evolution of the outline of this island. An important aspect of modeling the Anak Krakatoa flank, flank collapse was a volume estimation of the flank collapse, as well as understanding how much of the component was subaqueous and how much was subaerial. Here are a couple of examples of some cartoon sketches of what that looked like. This slide shows simulated landslide thickness at 0, 15, 30, and 90 seconds. You can see that the majority of the landslide thickness is concentrated in the southwest, consistent with the understanding that the flank collapse was in the southwestern direction. It's interesting to compare the suggested landslide thickness map above to the corresponding tsunami wave height, which is below. These are the 30 second and 90 second frames. And you can notice that both in the tsunami and the landslide thickness simulations, the southwestern portion has the highest tsunami wave energy and also the highest landslide energy. This is consistent with the understanding that the tsunami was actually focused away from the coastlines and in the southwestern direction. The water height simulation here is from the basic model of this study. And throughout the study, various versions were run to approximate the volume of flank collapse required to generate the observed tsunami and the observed runoffs. 
this event, the 2018 Anak Krakatoa eruption landslide tsunami, was a devastating tsunami that continues to encourage tsunami modeling to reach higher and broader levels. And it really motivates the improvement of tsunami forecasting and disaster mitigation.